الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah the Lord of the world and we ask him to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam upon his companions and all those who follow them on the path of righteousness until the day of recompense Islam is always under the microscope for controversial matters for the most part in fact if you just reflect on what we've covered in the last few days you will find that it's often trying to defend our beliefs or the criticism against Islam pertaining to the males and female relationship or pertaining to certain rulings or penal codes in Islam or slavery in Islam it's always like we're trying to prove that it is not as it's not bad as you're making it seem and that that negative perception you have is an accumulation of media that is dedicated to make us look bad because they can't find any other means to stop the spread of Islam which is a pretty amazing fact in spite of the propaganda Islam continues to spread at a faster rate than any other religion even though if you look from the outside it appears to be the most strict religion and it is it is in terms of being the only people who really have defined guidelines and agreed upon do's and don'ts you will not find this amongst any other nation or ideology or philosophy or religion so we stand out but it's ironic that the media exerts a lot of effort when they want to highlight areas which may make us look bad but our points of strength which are dominant apparent and undeniable are hardly ever mentioned and that is one of them if you think about the various religions that we have today you will find that for the most part racism and discrimination or nationalism or tribalism are part and parcel of that religion and I don't want to mention any examples because my objective right now is not to criticize or put down others my objective is to highlight where we stand but you can think of your own on your own about the religions out there and the existence of racism within them to the, to the point that there are certain places of worship where only people of a certain race can enter and if someone from another race entered it's like you're in the wrong place of worship as backwards as this is as abnormal as this is as repulsive as this is people don't like to talk about it. it's like shh keep it on the down low and they don't highlight it so you don't even reflect on it you don't stop and think about it but when it comes to Islam then they want to bring up everything else and this is what practicing double standards is Double standards is when, you, when you're not just with two separate entities. You allow one to have something that you disallow the other to have. You turn a blind eye towards an error here, but you don't. You highlight it there. However, if you go through, if I only gave you textual evidences right now, if this whole lecture was nothing but citation of textual evidences then you would have plenty of ayat from the Quran verses from the Quran 
and narrations from the Prophet Sallallahu to the point that I don't have to elaborate or speak or add anything. And I don't think any one of you here would leave with any confusion, misunderstanding or the need for any elaboration. Because it is the most straightforward thing you will ever come across in any religion. In terms of our true belief in equality. Equality that everybody, everybody shouts about. Everybody claims. Everybody highlights. But in reality, within their own ranks, there isn't equality. Be it from a male-female perspective, relationship, or race, or hierarchy. The people, the, more, the senior people, the way they treat those who are lesser than them in position within companies. In reality, people practice all type of bigotry. Around the clock, 24-7, non-stop. Only within the framework of Islamic teachings, where each one is guaranteed the true equality that they deserve. Because in the sight of the Creator, we are all the same. And there's only a couple of other elements that favor a person over the other. And that has to do with deeds and belief. It has nothing to do with any other aspect, any other element. To begin, we learn from the Quran something very important and related to some of the things we discussed in the last few days. When I gave the example of the comparison of human beings to the animals in the animal kingdom. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمُ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّمَّنْ خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا we, This is Allah's speech to His creation. All of you, all of you. We have certainly honored the children of Adam because we came from Adam, not from apes. We had a long debate with one of the guys here. Insisted that his grandfather was an ape. <laughs> you just, I mean, I just find it so difficult to deal with, man. Alhamdulillah, we have textual evidence that puts this dilemma to sleep. We have certainly honored the children of Adam and carried them on the land and sea. You guys see how we move around? If we had to use our feet only, and that is one means of carrying ourselves, life would be rough. But Allah facilitated the invention of bicycles, motorcycles, skateboards, airplanes, buses, cars, boats, yachts, and ships, and the list goes on. So we can move from a location to another that is quite far that we would not have been able. And this is of course modern. Go back in time and still use until now all of the animals that can be used. Horses and donkeys and what have you. These are all from the creation of Allah for us. That's why a human being for the most part is able to control an animal that is a hundred times stronger than him. If the animals were not subdued and submissive to the mankind, no man could ever ride a horse or a donkey or use a, a cow or a bull for any type of anything. Agriculture, you won't be able to use any animal. An insect can, can overcome you sometimes. A cat can bite you and run away. A dog can destroy you. But you find that animals... They work along with the son of Adam. We manage them, we control them in huge numbers. There are of course occasions where they snap. 
because of some oppression against them. So some of these intelligent people in the world who get a bunch of bulls and then they run in front of them. Like this is a tradition of the country. Then these animals, these bulls, man, gore people left and right and they, they, they get killed. And then if you wonder, then people feel sorry for the guy. Yeah, I feel sorry for him for doing this to the bull. But these are animals. Why, why let them go through this, this agony and pain? And they take revenge. Subhanallah, they put them to mock them. And then the animal takes revenge from the oppressors. So we have been given this favoritism from our Creator over the rest of the creation. And Allah says, and preferred them over much of what we have created with definite preference. So first and foremost, we must understand that the ayah says, Bani Adam, and that means all of the children of Adam. That means by default now, any other type of profiling is not taken into consideration. This is now helicopter view for the idea of the non-existence of racism within Islam. But we will dig deeper and be more specific. Allah says in relation to how we're supposed to work with one another, O oh people, this is in Surah Al-Hujurat, Ayah 13, we have created you male and female. Both were mentioned. And made you nations and tribes. So if we, want, if we don't continue the ayah, if I stopped right now, and if I asked you, according to our current situation, According to our current affairs, how would you continue this ayah? This verse from the Quran, how would you continue it? Not according to the revelation, according to the reality. It would be something along the lines that God made us in nations and tribes, so we may overtake each other, invade each other, fight against one another, kill each other. That's what happens today. Even if you take religion out of the whole concept, forget about the religious entities, talking about within uh, countries and, 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 and politics and what have you. How many countries right now are like on the verge of nuclear war? On the verge of going and attacking? How many threats do we hear? How many countries are building nuclear uh, powers and what have you? Of course, this is futuristic. Past, World War I, World War II, and you've seen plenty. That's because human beings are... They love to defy God. Somehow, we are given very clear, basic instructions and advice, and we just love to defy and we bear the consequences of our decisions. So Allah says that you may know one another. The reason why He made us male and female and tribes and nations so that we may know one another. This necessitates that you are considerate towards other people. You're able to establish a platform for communication so that you can know one another otherwise it's impossible to know someone by waving at them every day from 20 meters away you don't know that person if someone said do you know him well I mean I wave every day in the morning but not really do you know his name I don't know his name you know his age I don't know his age where is he from I don't know what classes does he attend I don't know so you don't know that person you can only know someone when you spend time with them, communicate with them, socialize with them. And this is a lesson for the Muslims. Whichever environment you're in, in any opportunity, it should be by default in your mind, creating a network 
amongst people. Those who know me know what this means. <laughs> Allah is A sip of coffee to be patient. Every single time you're out there, you should make it an objective to interact with non-Muslims. The only exception would be if you are a really, if you're an introvert and you're very uncomfortable, you're, you're not social by nature, then of course, لا يكلف الله نفسا Allah will not burden a soul beyond its capabilities. No problem. But for the rest who don't have this issue, who don't have this limitation, every single time you should be creating new relationships. When you play sports, when you go, uh, to go out to eat, when you are at the 7-Eleven buying something, it's an opportunity for you to speak to another human being. So you may know that person. Knowing that person facilitates harmony in the society. Less hatred, less racism, less bigotry. So the Muslims have to take lead because this is our point of strength that we can brag about. That even the media which hates our guts can't say anything about this one. Even though we have our internal issues. But they cannot say anything about this one. Then Allah concluded the ayah by saying, Verily the most noble of you to Allah is the most righteous of you. Verily Allah is knowing and aware. That's it. And this is the second foundation. The most noble, the most noble person to Allah is the most righteous in the sight of Allah. Anything else is not taken into consideration, period. But today, everything else is taken into consideration. Are you from the local people or a foreigner? Are you an insider or an outsider? What citizenship do you have? What skin color do you have? Do you know that there are certain universities without mention in the country? These are universities where they educate people. Where the ignorant educate people. If a person has dark skin, he will not get the job in spite of his qualifications. They want a white man. You know why they do this? Well, of course, because they're stupid. But besides that, that stupidity has an extension to the parents of the students who will now enroll their kids if they know that the school has white Western instructors. If they're Arabs, doesn't fly. If they're African, oh no, it doesn't fly. If they're from the subcontinent, it won't fly either. But they get funny. From the subcontinent, dark features, but British passport. With them, it doesn't fly. They say, put that passport, soak it in water and drink it. You have to have a plastic surgery, Habibi. And change all that stuff that you have. Then come back and uh, apply in Abshir. You'll get the job on the spot. And I'm not just speaking from my foot. I actually experienced this. But it was for a different reason. Because I lived in the States for some years. My accent might deceive some as being American. But I'm Lebanese. And so I went to the school where they were trying to hire me. And for whatever reason, the, the person who interviewed me was under the impression, based on the interview, he didn't bother to look at the CV, 
that I'm American and he told the principal of the school that I'm American. So they're happy they're getting an American teacher. And when I went to meet the principal, he was a little more intelligent than the supervisor. He's looking through the CV. He saw that I am Lebanese. He freaked out in front of me. He, so he told the guy, as if I'm not there. You told me he's American. Well, this guy is Lebanese. What are we going to do? Cut the salary in half. <laughs> Wallahi, I swear by Allah. They said, sorry, we can't give you the previous salary. Now we're going to give you this. I said, are you out of your mind, man? Because I have this, you know, my mind doesn't accept certain things and I'm, I'm outspoken. So I wasn't going to be like, okay, thank you so much. I'm going to leave. I said, you have a problem? You have a pro are you serious? You're hiring my capabilities or my passport? Is my passport going to give the class? Do I just put it on the table and go sleep? And everybody gets educated? I'm the one doing the job, man. What's your business? Whether I am Chinese or American or Batikha. <laughs> Batikha wasn't involved then. I got the job with the original salary. And this is a lesson for you. Most companies will try to pay you as least as they can if you don't negotiate. Even companies that have a system, your salary is often based on your negotiation skills during the interview. And what they do is, and I'm telling you this from, from my job, I know what I'm talking about. They will take advantage of the fresh graduate. Like, we're doing you a favor, you don't, you don't have any experience. Yalla ma'alish, I will give you a job. And they will give you 50% of what you deserve. And you're happy because it's your first job, so you accept. In reality, you graduated as an engineer, you should be getting paid an arm and a leg. And I know brothers who went through this. They got gypped. They got deceived. And then now they put you through this process of, well, after two years, you're eligible for a promotion. And it's just a long process before you get to the number that you were supposed to get from day one. So unless the company has like, they show you some fixed numbers, wherein this is the basic or something of the sort, if it's open, keep aiming for high. And then when you see it's a dead end, you settle down at the end. But don't accept the first offer they give you. This is a side comment, obviously. طيب. So then we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us all equal. And so we don't have this type of favoritism except if you fear Allah. Some people say, well, you know, you have black people and white people and yellow people and brown people. How many, how many colors do we have? Like, does anyone know the, all the colors? We have white, black, brown, yellow, anything else? What? Albino? Alpino? Oh, is it alpino or albino? Well, it might be him. Go to the alpines and ski over there, Barakallah Fiq. Are there more? Well, don't you think that this is amazing that we came from parents, like two, a male and a female, whatever their color was? And then look at the diversity. People look at this in a completely wrong way. And the Quran teaches us that this is one of the signs of the greatness of Allah. Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Among his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your languages and your colors. Verily in that, which was mentioned right now, are signs for people of knowledge. Meaning only true intellectuals appreciate the diversity that we have in terms of languages and color. And ignorant people are the ones who not only they don't appreciate, but they use this for their evil intents and evil discrimination and evil racism. 
And that is a clear-cut evidence about the nature of the ignorant person who believes he is better than someone else because of his tribe, because of his lineage, or because of his skin color or passport or what have you. This is a trait of ignorance. And that same person will have the nerve to point at you and tell you that you in your religion, you have A, B, C, D problem. But they don't see the most backward, repulsive, disgusting type of profiling ever. Racism. Racism that allowed a group, I mean, a group of people to enslave in the ugliest way possible. Yani if, if you, and this is from, from countries that supposedly promote uh, democracy and what have you. What happened in these places and how long it took before this was eradicated and guess what? It is not eradicated. When I lived there, I used to hang out with certain people in Houston, Texas who say behind the, back, behind the backs of black people things that you will never believe someone will say in this century. When I would hang out with them, I would hear things, their current belief, their current feelings towards the African Americans you will think that this is from a movie. But it's not. These racist people live until today. They exist and they practice their racism, but they're liars. When they see someone who's African American, they put on an act. And they start speaking differently. Yo homie, what's up, Mehmet? Allah, he's your homie? Allah, like, oh fuck. Liars, liars through their teeth. And I would only wonder, how can this be? How can these people exist and claim that there's no more racism when it is, it is ingrained, it is built in, in their systems? Listen to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Verily, Allah the Exalted created Adam from a handful which he took from the earth. So the children of Adam come in accordance with the earth. Some come with red skin, white skin, or black skin. This is how the diversity. We're all from Adam, and then because we were created with that connection with earth, and earth has this diversity in colors, in the, in, in the soil, Similarly, we come from earth and Adam is from dust. So we technically come from dust. And that is how Allah created us with His mercy and with His majesty. And He prohibited us from looking down upon each other because of this trait or because of this fact. There's another hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because you have to realize by the way that racism has existed throughout the centuries and it existed in pre-Islamic days. In fact, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came to a nation that was very racist. So racism against Africans in general has existed for centuries and it existed among the Arabs back then. And I will cite some incidents that happened at the time of the Prophet ﷺ and his comments on this on the situation for you to understand the proper Islamic teachings. But you have to know that contextually speaking, racism has or had already existed when Islam came about. So in his final farewell sermon, the last lecture, if we may call it, where the Prophet ﷺ addressed a crowd of people. Not when he was, for example, in his room and there were a couple of companions. When he was speaking to the masses, he said, O oh people, your Lord is one and your father Adam is one. There is no virtue 
of an Arab over a foreigner, nor a foreigner over an Arab, and neither white skin over black skin, nor black skin over white skin, except by righteousness. Have I not delivered the message? And we say in response, Yes, you did, O Messenger of Allah. Yes, he did. And today among the Muslims, I would say, sadly, there's plenty of racism from Arabs and against Arabs. Arabs are racist. Now, I'm, when I say this, I'm never generalizing. I'm speaking about the existence of the problem amongst some. The percentage of, a percentage of which I can't define. But I know. I've sat. I've spent time with Arabs, Muslims, who I would think they would be a little more mature or clever, who are actually racist against any non-Arab, even if he's a Muslim. And I thought it was one way, and I wish it was one way. At least it's half the problem. But I've also experienced that in reverse. What people fail in realizing is that very often the one, and this is, this is very technical, pay attention, and you might be guilty of this without knowing. Very often, those who have been treated in a racist way, yani people are racist against them, they develop racism themselves and they think it's justifiable. And they don't see that they're being racist. So you might spend time with certain Africans who now hate white people. Because white people did this to them, white people enslaved them, white people... But you're not fixing the problem. You are now guilty of the very crime that they committed against you. We're not saying it's okay, you know, take it easy, don't worry about it. No, of course you have the right to be hurt. You have the right to be upset. You have the right to be offended. But what is the benefit if you become racist as well? So they have black power and black this and all now it became, now it's like, it's, it's the thing to be black. No, Habibi. It is not the thing to be black. And it's not the thing to be white. And it's not the thing to be yellow or brown. It's nothing, none of, none of it matters. So we wind up falling into the thing we criticize the people about. And I've experienced that as well. Especially when you travel a lot. You see, you read between the lines. So the fact that the black people were mistreated does not justify now that they have something that is specific to them in which they become racist against others. Because they're not changing. They're not improving. They're not enhancing. And only Islam can rectify this situation. In another narration, the Prophet ﷺ said, No one is better than anyone else except by religion or good deeds. It is sufficient evil for a man to be profane, vulgar, greedy, or cowardly. If you want to, if someone wants to be belittled, wants to open himself for belittlement, then there are certain traits which he carries that will make the people look down upon him and those have nothing to do with his background or skin color or citizenship. Profane, vulgar, greedy, cowardly, yep. These are deserving that the person is looked down upon by others. But as the beginning mentions, there's absolutely no, no one is better than anyone except religion and good deeds. Believer or disbeliever? There are more narrations that explain it. There's an incident that happened between Abu Dhar al-Ghafari radiallahu anhu wa ardah and Bilal. Bilal ibn Rabah. 
radiyallahu anhu arda. And I think Sheikh Muhammad highlighted yesterday uh, the Bilal in his talk, in his short talk. Abu Umama reported that Abu Dhar reproached Bilal about his mother. Saying, O oh, son of a black woman. Mind you, like I said, racism existed among the Arabs prior to Islam. Islam came to eradicate this racism. And you will see how. Bilal went to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and told him what Abu Dhar had said to him. The Prophet became angry. And the Prophet would rarely be angry. He was the type that was always smiling. He was easygoing. He was soft with the people. He would rarely become angry. But this was an occasion that necessitated the anger of the Messenger of Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And while he was angry, Abu, Abu Dhar came. And he was not aware. He was not aware that Bilal had informed the Messenger of Allah about what Abu Dhar said about him. The Prophet, when Abu Dhar came, the Prophet turned away from him. Didn't want to speak to him. And Abu Dhar asked, O Messenger of Allah, have you turned away because of something you have been told? Obviously, about what I did. The Prophet ﷺ said, Have you reproached Bilal? Reproach is like belittled or looked down upon. Have you reproached Bilal about his mother? By the one who revealed the book to Muhammad, swearing by Allah Azzawajal. None is more virtuous over another except by righteous deeds. And then he said, in another narration, you are a person who still has a trait of ignorance in you. Now, this by no means can be used for any funny person who wants to now belittle Abu Dhar. Because that is not the objective of the story. Because Abu Dhar eventually apologized and he put down his face on the floor and he told Bilal to step on it as means of retribution for that offense because of the gravity of this offense. And Bilal instead refused to do this and he hugged and they cried. They hugged each other and cried because of the brotherhood in Islam. And this is a sign that a person can come from an un-Islamic environment and carry some un-Islamic traits. And when they fall into something like this, it is our job to highlight to them that this is un-Islamic. This is from the traits of ignorance. And it doesn't mean that we kick them out or we shun them completely. No, these are our brothers. But it also means we shouldn't overlook or disregard qualities that Islam did not endorse. So if you see a person being racist, call him out. Don't be, don't be passive about it. Don't accept it. Don't let it slide. If you see your own brother speaking about another Muslim because of his race or skin color, then shut him up and tell him to fear Allah. Tell him you have a trait of jahiliya in you. Inna kamru'un fihi jahiliya. This is ignorance from pre-Islamic days. Have some shame. This is your brother in faith. Because if we don't actively behave this way, then we will also have that disease of racism and bigotry and tribalism within us. And even though it is minimal within the Islamic framework, it exists. Much lesser than others, but it is there. And it is our obligation to fight it tooth and nail. The Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah, 
Verily Allah has removed from you the pride of the time of ignorance with its boasting of ancestors. Verily one is only a righteous believer or a miserable sinner. Subhanallah, the, the adjective. The adjective which is used here is mind-blowing. A miserable sinner. All of the people are the children of Adam. And Adam was created from dust. So you can see already how many times the Prophet ﷺ was highlighting to the people this fundamental principle. So far around four or five narrations besides the verses in the Quran. And this issue of the boasting of ancestors is the closest thing now to nationalism. And that is a disease which we have in various Muslim countries where we make a separation between locals and foreigners. And I am not speaking from a government point of view. So we can be clear, because some people also have a misconception. As in, you would expect that a government of a country should look after its citizens. And if there are so many foreigners in the country so that the citizens themselves don't have a job, then that creates an internal problem. So it is justifiable and logical that you want to support the people of the country who carry the citizenship. And anyone would do this. So I'm not speaking about this type of division. I'm speaking about within the religious ranks. Within the non-religious ranks, it depends on the observation of the government. And think about it, if you had your own government, and you had your own people who are unemployed, and you get foreign workers who are willing to take half of the salary, then the local people become poor. Why do they belong to this country? This country has its entity, has its, its authority. So this is a very logical move. How it's executed is debatable. Some people, because of the right they have, they go that extra mile and wind up discriminating in the process in areas where discrimination is not allowed. But my concern is to highlight within the religious ranks that someone will think because I live in a particular country and so this is my Islam and you're bringing some other Islam from another country so I'm not interested Islam is not defined by countries Islam is there's not a special brand because today today we have many Islams I'll tell it to you flat out we have Western Islam these are the funky people who want to insert funk and coolness and uh, innovation and advancement into Islam. In every area they find. Islam is like complete, it's just a party. Islam is a party from the first day till you die. Then you have subcontinent Islam. Sub and we can elaborate, but I don't want to, I don't want to go there. They're laughing because they know what's up. Then you have certain tribes within the Arabs whom if you're not even one of his tribe you're not really a Muslim and they will not marry their daughters to somebody from another tribe because they're not real Muslims we in this city not this city that's what they're saying in their city they are the only real Muslims and the rest are just a bunch of clowns that just carry similar names and then we have Islam for the Middle Eastern people. Which is a mix with Christianity and Christmas and Halloween and all types of stuff. And a lot of grave worshipping and, so and all types of stuff. And every time you go to a region, you find that there are common traits where Islam to a large degree is just like that. Then in the Gulf it's Wahhabism. The Wahhabis. The radicals, extremists, uh, blah, blah, blah. 
You know this because you've heard this, you've experienced this, you are aware of this. And this is something the Prophet ﷺ warned us against severely. We are brothers and sisters in faith. These things should not define us. What I and you and everybody must refer to is the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of our early generations. Period. Not Maulana back home. We don't even know Maulana back home where he got his stuff from. A lot of these Maulanas now are Google Maulanas. He Googles it, he shares it, and then the people implement it. And it becomes a Sunnah in that region. I want to mention another narration of the Prophet ﷺ related to this issue. Because again, nationalism and tribalism, tribalism is, is only in certain countries where they have tribes, not, not everywhere. The Prophet said, Laysa minna man da'a ila asabiyya, wa laysa minna man qatala ala asabiyya, wa laysa minna man mata ala asabiyya. He is not one of us who calls to tribalism, i.e. nationalism. He is not one of us who fights for the sake of tribalism. And he is not one of us who dies following the way of tribalism. And that last part of the hadith is the scariest. He's not one of us. He's being excluded. No, you can't make takfir on this guy. You can't expel him from Islam because of one part of a narration like many ignorant people do today. They get one ayah, one part of an ayah, one hadith, one part of a hadith, and then they bring, take people out of Islam wholesale. Which justifies violence against them, mistreating them, uh, taking advantage of them, and the list goes on. We don't have the right to do this. But this is a warning that that person is not, in, not among the body of Muslims. So how many of us are nationalists? They find pride in their country. And I told you yesterday, my stance as a Lebanese, I couldn't care less. Wallahi, I couldn't care less. I shouldn't care less. You shouldn't care less. Are you going to boast because the Qadr of Allah allowed you to be born in that country, therefore have the citizenship? Is that something special about you that you've earned? Is that a qualification that you have? A credential that you're entitled to? You haven't done nothing. It's just the decree of God. That you carry, that you're part of this nation. What are you showing off about? How many times have I said to a brother innocently from the subcontinent, are you Pakistani? No, I'm Indian. Or I said to the Indian, are you Indian? So now I'm Pakistani. Brother, I'm trying to get married. I, I know an Indian sister. No brother, only Pakistani. Ya Habibi, you live next to each other. You're all the same. And the same, I'm not just criticizing others. We, I, my people, same thing. Lebanese people don't like Syrian. Syrian people don't like Lebanese. How stupid is that? We all live in the same region. You can tell the difference. And if we were to continue, I can give you hundreds of examples. And because we're dominated by the Western world, then this is where you shine. The people with the Western passport, those override everybody. Even though many of them 
tend to be more humble than some of us. You guys know Malcolm X? Let me tell you what he said. Of course, you know his story. Um, and he struggled a lot with the problem of race in America. At first, he embraced a path of extremism in his confrontation with white supremacy. But his heart changed when he performed his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca. In Mecca, he saw white, black, red, and all kinds of people joining the Hajj as one brotherhood. He wrote back to his friends in Harlem, saying, America needs to understand Islam. Because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white. But the white attitude was removed from their minds by the religion of Islam. I have never before seen sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together, irrespective of their color. During the past 11 days, here in the Muslim world, I have eaten from the same plate, drunk from the same glass, and slept on the same rug, while praying to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And in the words and in the deeds of the white Muslims, I tell the same since I felt the same sincerity that I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. We were truly all the same, because their belief in one God had removed the white from their minds, the white from their behavior, and the white from their attitude. I could see from this that perhaps if white Americans could accept the oneness of God, then perhaps too they could accept in reality the oneness of man, and, and cease to measure and hinder and harm others in terms of their differences in color. That is genius right there. That is the embodiment and the manifestation and the true understanding of the value of the Islamic perspective on racism. And that is the behavior which we Muslims should also portray. Because what made him reach this point is in reality mixing with people that truly did not believe they were superior to others because of their background or skin color. Could we say this today? It de I would say it depends on the crowd. It depends on the people he, hang he, he would be with. Some may still display some superiority because of their skin color. So after this, it would be very difficult to believe that Islam encourages any type of racism, tribalism, bigotry, or hatred because of someone's background, or ancestors, or qualifications, or what have you. The Prophet ﷺ said, كُونُوا عِبَادَ اللَّهِ إِخْوَانًا Be, O slaves of Allah, brothers to one another. And that encompasses the sisters. But because the males were the recipients for the most part, then the narrations often come speaking to the male. And we have principles by which we understand that females are included unless proven otherwise. This is a great trait. And we have two missions based on this reality. Mission number one is that within ourselves, within our nations, within our societies, we as Muslims should remove whatever remnants of racism and nationalism that exist amongst us.
Because we know they're there. We should clean them out. And we should actively advise and each other when we see a form of racism taking place. Don't be passive about it. Secondly, this is one of the tools we can use in showing the beauty of Islam. Because I believe we spend a lot of time trying to defend Islam against attacks and we spend little time showing the beautiful teachings of Islam from within which I believe would be the most effective tool of da'wah because if I were a non-Muslim and I heard these narrations of the Messenger of Allah I would love him by default I would love a man who actively spoke in this manner to spread equality among mankind. Something that I don't see today. I would appreciate a man saying this 1400 years ago. And I would appreciate that there were people who quoted his words and they wrote them down and they were cited generation after generation so we can say them now verbatim, word for word. I would appreciate a nation that went out of its way to quote the words of this man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and deliver it to us today in this format. And that would be the stance of the average non-Muslim who may be unaware of how fair Islam is when it comes to humans. But because this is not in their interest, they don't want to discuss this. They go pick on male, female. In spite of knowing that we are not the same. And they want Islam to tell them that they are the same. In every respect. They are the same in many respects. And they are different. As you can see before your eyes. In many different ways. But they want equality. They want the woman to be like a man and the man to be like a woman. And if Islam doesn't tell them explicitly to please their ears, they are the same, they want to wage war against Islam and Muslims that we have issues and we... Come on now. You have to be fair. You have to reason. Appreciate the diversity. Just like, that's why in the previous ayat, Allah mentioned in the context of the differences between us, He also mentioned the difference in the language. And He mentioned in the beginning of the verse, male and female. I say to the feminists, or if they are masculinists, I don't know if they exist. Appreciate the diversity. Just like we appreciate languages, skin color, appreciate that women are unique and without them we can't survive. And men are unique and without us they can't survive. It doesn't get better than that. Instead of trying to merge us together on constant basis to be the same. So the woman who does like CrossFit exercise, Looks like she would knock you out cold. Before she punches you. And I would be watching like CrossFit videos. I'm like, dude, this guy's buff. And then it turns out to be a lady. I was like, dang. And then she's, of course, there must be a CrossFit sister here right now who's getting all insulted. You know. If you maintain your feminine, feminine, feminist, femin, femininism, femininity, whatever the word is, go ahead and cross fit and cross jump and cross all you want. But if you're going to turn out to be like a man with freaking muscles and biceps and triceps and big old shoulders, you have to realize 99.99% of men are not going to be attracted to you because you're abnormal. Just like a woman, by default, is not going to be attracted to a very feminine man. 
I don't even want to emulate what that might look like. She will be friends with him. You know, but it's like, I need a man in my life. You look like a man, but you don't act like a man. And yes, exceptions exist, which we don't care about. Those exceptions which exist are insignificant and should be overlooked. If you give them a lot of attention, they will never, you will never hear the end of it. And because people gave them more attention than they deserve, now they want to overrule the world. So I saw today a guy wearing a shirt that appears to be of a particular background. People of that kind of, uh, in, in terms of their sexuality, that says, what? I took a picture. It says, uh, make way as we are about to conquer. That's the message. Meaning we're going to come with this, where you reach a point, where you enter a bathroom, and you see a lady there. Because that person believes that their sexuality is that of a male. And vice versa. Already in some countries, a male can enter the bathroom of females and say that I identify myself as a female, even though physically, not a female. And you can't say Jack. You can't say a word. Certain retailers in America are there already. Do your research. If the woman wanted to complain, they will say, shut up. He has the right to be in this bathroom. But how is that? That's the way it goes. Don't you want your rights? Don't you want equality between male and female in every direction, in every choice, in every preference? Tfaddal. Take it all now. Then next will come the child molesters. Where are our rights? <laughs> yes, Habibi, you, you will see. Quote me on this. You will see. The day will come where they will carry their banners. And they will say, God created me by default, loving little kids, man. I can't treat it, there's no medicine, I was born this way. And you are a sick person for discriminating against me, for liking little kids and doing something about it. You cannot tell them no, because you couldn't tell the ones before no. And human beings are freaks. And they play around all day. This is why we say we are doomed for destruction unless we follow the divine revelation of God. Which puts an end to all this nonsense and all this circus. It ends with the revelation of God. You know your role, you know your role. You handle business, you coexist, you co-survive, you don't mistreat each other, you all end up in paradise. Anything else will fail. And everything else has failed and continues to fail. This is why we need religion in our lives. This is why religion is the solution today. This is why Islam offers the full-fledged, guaranteed 100% solution for mankind. In every respect. Economically, financially, socially, psychologically, every respect. Which religion forbids interest? What is interest anyways? Getting a loan? Because you need money? So they can dig a hole for you? And put you in it? And step on you so you have to pay them back more for you to come out of the hole. And every time you come out, they push you back in. Because you didn't pay on time, that's another 3% on you. Islam promotes a goodly loan. You need money, here's 5,000 ringgits. When your situation is better, you give me back 5,000 ringgits. Not here's 5,000 ringgits because you need it, but I want it back 7,500 ringgits. 
Did I really help you or take advantage of your need? Because I have these 5,000 ringgits anyways, they're sitting in my drawer. I don't need them. So I'm actually taking advantage of someone who needs help. Islam put an end to this nonsense. And made it prohibited for you to accept and ask and take interest. Which they call interest and there's nothing interesting about it. It's another one of the ways they play with words to make them more you know, plausible to the people. It's usury because you're using people. Sexually transmitted diseases, the solution is marriage and no relationships outside of that. Racism, the solution is Islam and equality. Alcoholism, not allowed. You want to stop all of these dramas and all of the calamities that happen because of the drunkards who exist in this world, then only Islam is the solution. You want to live in a clean, non-smoking environment, then only Islam is the solution. Because smoking is a no-no in Islam as well. Anything that harms you or harms others is not allowed. But people turn away from this and they do everything else and in the midst of their nonsense, they want to point finger at you and say your religion, your extremism, you're trying to promote this, you're trying to promote that. Come on. Wake up already. See things the way they need to be seen. So in conclusion, I repeat before you that Islam has successfully made human beings appreciate each other based on their relationship with God, not anything else. And that is the most honorable quality a religion can possess. هذا والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد.